What if I told you there used to be a hidden world lurking within the realm of The Sims Online? A world of dark secrets and virtual mysteries from a sim mafia casting menacing shadows, demanding payment under threat of chaos, to a fully functional cyber brothel. From real estate scams to organized crime syndicates, let's take a deep dive into the murky depths of the player-run economy in one of the most popular online games of the early 2000s. Hello everyone and welcome to The Sims Lore. Today we'll be exploring the seedy underbelly of The Sims Online and expose the criminal activities that took place within its virtual world. Hold on to your hats cause this one will be a wild ride. So go grab your snacks, let me know what you're having in that snack report and don't forget to subscribe and like this if you enjoyed it. Alright, let's get straight into the video. Firstly, let's do some introductions. In 2002, Maxis and EA Games released The Sims Online, a multiplayer evolution of the beloved life simulation series. It required a separate monthly subscription of $9.99 and allowed players to create unique sims, immerse themselves in the fictional city of Alphaville, and collaborate with others to build skills and earn in-game currency. The game offered official job options like restaurant, robot factory, DJ and dancer, but these jobs provided low salaries, pushing players to explore alternative income sources, like setting up item shops and offering services such as food and lodging. To be able to do those things, however, players would have to spend a lot of time building skills, so the game became very repetitive and players found they spent too much time skill building. Once you earned in-game currency, you were then able to purchase your own home and customize it with decorations and furnishings. The heart of The Sims Online, however, lay in its social interactions. Players communicated through text chat or in-game objects, and they could form groups or clans with other players who shared common interests. They could compete against each other in various challenges and contests, and even trade items and resources. Trust played a vital role, and a feature that facilitated user interaction in the game was the option to designate another user as a trusted friend. This feature was represented through a visual display where the faces of users who had deemed you trustworthy appeared outlined in green. These faces were arranged in a hub-and-spoke pattern, all connected to your own face at the centre. Players often relied on checking each other's hubs to make important in-game decisions such as becoming roommates in a house. These choices held significant consequences for new users, and reversing a bad decision was a challenging process. While this feature had its merits, The Sims Online differed from other social networks by allowing users to also designate others as untrustworthy. In this case, the face of an untrustworthy user would stand out, encircled in bright red, among all the trustworthy faces in a user's hub. The game was played in real time, meaning that events and changes in the game world would occur continuously, even when the player was offline. The Sims Online had a player-run economy, with the real estate market being the largest and most active. However, players faced security issues due to the lack of proper deed trade system until EA Land was introduced much later. Properties were categorized under welcome, money, skills, services, entertainment, romance, shopping, games, offbeat, and residence, with special items available in each category. In early 2005, the game faced a bug where a clothing rack could be used to duplicate profits, damaging the economy. The issue was resolved three years late, but by that time, it was a little bit too late. The economy was now entirely player-run, with skills being highly valued due to in-game job requirements and money objects. Custom content could also be created and sold to other players. The game was shut down in 2008, about six years after its initial release. Before this, in March 2007, EA announced the implementation of significant improvements and a rebranding of the product under the new name EA Land. However, despite efforts to improve the game and attract new players, it was ultimately deemed unviable and was shut down. The reason for the shutdown was largely due to the game's lackluster performance and dwindling player base. The game failed to attract and retain a significant number of players, and the costs of maintaining the servers and developing new content outweighed the revenue it generated. 
EA Games shifted its focus to other online games, such as The Sims Social, a Facebook-based game that was launched in 2011. Now that we've delved deeper into The Sims Online, understanding its rise to stardom and subsequent unfortunate decline, let's dig into the core of the matter. What triggered its downfall? I have scoured the internet endlessly for the juicy drama, and here it is. The story begins in October of 2002, during the early days of The Sims Online's beta testing. An avatar going by the name of Roller Girl emerged, and they quickly rose to fame amongst the other players, holding the top position as the most popular sim. Sometime during beta, Roller Girl met Go Go Girl, and after deciding they were long lost sisters, they decided to build a property together and name it Sim Sorority House. Here, the avatars were able to skill, make money, and socialize all on the same lot, as Maxis had not yet imposed restrictions that would disallow multitasking. But the Sim Sorority House held a treasure trove of such items and opportunities. The house was always full, having had eight roommates in total at the very beginning. However, as the sorority grew, the application requests also stacked up high. Amongst these applications, Roller Girl received plenty male avatars trying to join the sorority, so she had a friend with a male avatar set up some fraternity house in a neighboring lot. All seemed to be running smoothly, until a month later in November, when preparations for the full game began. One day, as the Roller Girl persona attempted to sign into the account, they made a shocking discovery. The Sim Sorority House, the housemates, as well as the renowned Roller Girl avatar and all its ranks were gone. A complete wipeout by Maxis to start afresh for the game's full release. But all was not lost as Roller Girl embarked on the journey to rebuild, beginning with the avatar. Yet, as the avatar's popularity surged, an imitator surfaced, arriving before the original persona could reclaim the character's identity. Shortly after the wipe, another avatar emerged by the name of Mia Wallace. If that sounds familiar, that's because the name was a character in Pulp Fiction by Quentin Tarantino. As it turned out, Mia was the original Roller Girl, and soon the old persona under the new avatar rose back to fame, as word spread of Sim Sorority House making a full comeback. However, a year after beta testing, things took a turn for Mia. With its full release to the public, the game had garnered a substantial player base, and as a result, the virtual realm became a breeding ground for all kinds of mischievous activities. This brought about some trouble for Mia and her property, who had reached an incredibly high rank, making her the number one sim in game. With all this popularity came a lot of unwanted negative attention from jealous members. A fierce rivalry unfolded between Mia and one of her sorority sisters, Hallow Queen. Queen went so far as to send harassers Mia's way, prompting Mia to enlist hitmen, each for a hefty sum of 10,000 simoleons to target Queen with red links. Queen then assumed a new avatar identity by the name of Naturel and managed to befriend Mia, ultimately leading to an invitation to become a sorority sister. However, the morning after being invited, the Sim Sorority House met a shocking fate, vanishing from existence, and the vulgar word st plastered in its place. Strangely, Mia and Queen somehow found a way to reconcile a short while later, with Queen returning as a roommate in Sim Sorority House. During the same time as Mia's first rivalry, the game saw the emergence of Hotel Erotica, the first cyber brothel in The Sims Online, where users could request explicit interactions in exchange for simoleons. An avatar by the name of Frankie Merrill and another player, Evangeline, operated this establishment together. However, Hotel Erotica only ranked between 5 and 7, unlike Sim Sorority House, which held the coveted number 1 position. As a result, Meryl started harassing Mia and her roommates by sending Sims over to redlink them, messaging her very disturbing things, and even going as far as threatening her life. 
Despite Mia's numerous attempts to report Meryl's behaviour to Max's, where Mia had chat logs containing threats of real-life harm and harassment persisting, Max's claimed there was insufficient evidence for conclusive punishment. Mia eventually received confirmation from Meryl that their actions were driven by jealousy, with Meryl expressing a desire to be the most hated sim since Mia was the most liked. Fed up and angry about all the threats and harassment, Mia and Queen collaborated on a character named Super Simet, with plans to apply to work in Hotel Erotica and spy on Meryl. They also created a backup account named Fireblaze, which was planted in the hotel as well, just in case they got the boot with the first avatar. Within 24 hours of setting up the avatars, Hotel Erotica met the same fate as Sim Sorority House once did with the property completely vandalized and the world slut written with a pool and outlined in red carpet. To further retaliate, Mia and Queen gathered their friends to mass report the incident to Maxis under the guise of abuse of an in-game object, blaming it all on Simet, a member of Hotel Erotica. This led to a back and forth battle between Maxis and Hotel Erotica as Simet repeatedly recreated the slur words on the lot only for Maxis to delete it again. This resulted in all Hotel Erotica roommates receiving 72-hour suspensions for bad behaviour, which delighted the sorority duo. Once they finished the mission, Mia and Samet could be seen doing a happy dance on the hotel lot after their final successful vandalization. Interestingly, Meryl's avatar popped up next to them, said busted, and deleted the vandalism. This left Mia bewildered and convinced that the avatar couldn't possibly belong to Meryl. Mia reasoned that if it had been the genuine Meryl, both of them would have been kicked out from the lot by Meryl, likely followed by a barrage of personal messages. Mia then had an interesting thought. What if the avatar was actually an EA representative masquerading as Meryl? Later, reports began circulating throughout the town recounting instances of people attempting to engage with avatars they had known for a while, only to receive silence in response, followed by a swift sign-off. After the fiasco with the hotel where multiple members were facing bans, another avatar entered the scene. This character went by the name of JC Soprano. He declared to be a mafia leader and demanded money from Mia for protection from his Mafians? I mean, really, did these people even watch The Sopranos? Anyway, Mia, who held a lot of sway in the game, wasn't too bothered by this. However, JC's character intrigued them, and the idea of joining forces with the Soprano family to create the Sim Mafia seemed interesting. The group would unite the Prophilic Wallace family with the newly established Soprano family, leading to the formation of the Sim Mafia. While JC wanted to control others, in criminal ways by extortion and theft, Mia wasn't yet convinced. Under the guise of this new group, JC instructed his mafiosos to harass new players and demand money in exchange for protection and or extra membership fees. These people would later be referred as grievers, characters causing others grief. At this stage, Mia wasn't fully convinced by what JC was doing. They asserted that the Wallace family was not involved in these types of intimidation tactics and that they primarily worked against grievers, but admitted to acting against some members when warranted, especially those causing trouble and harassment. Tired of being labelled as a mafia boss, Mia set up a faction under the name of the Sims Shadow Government and under this group, the Wallace family would work against grievers. Mia was also very adamant in their public interviews, which were starting to come out as the media got a hold of the crimes being carried out in-game. During these interviews, they stated that the Wallace family never demanded money or membership fees from people. In one such interview with the Alphaville Herald, they said the following. It was fun for the first few days or week. It gave my friends and I a label or name and a place to belong to in-game. We never did extortions or demanded money from Sims for protection or membership fees or dues from members like the Soprano family did. The Wallace family was more geared towards griefing the griever. Anyone that would approach us in a threatening manner, we would try and talk to them, and when they started to curse at us and proclaim that they'd never stop grieving us, like oh so many did, we took matters into our own hands. 
Subsequently, the Sim Mafia received a bad name in Alphaville due to JC Soprano leaving the game and allowing a 16-year-old going by the name of Levin Soprano to run the Mafia group. Levin Soprano demanded taxes on properties that they were then planning to open as casinos. Mia removed themselves from any connection to the Mafia and JC and started their own faction. A lot of people claim that this was the sole work of Jeremy Chase, also going by the infamous name JC Soprano. But in my opinion, that's all because of this Wired article on The Sims Online that painted him as a mob leader explaining how he used to go about his extortion and other illegal activities within the game. However, they're leaving out a lot of different people involved in this. But I've done enough digging to know and find out it definitely wasn't just that simple. A blog named the Alphaville Herald, ran by a man named Peter Ludlow, covered news, events and issues related to virtual worlds, particularly Second Life. The blog features articles, opinion pieces, and editorials written by various contributors and covers topics such as virtual economies, virtual politics, virtual fashion, and virtual communities. The website has been active since 2003, although it seems they haven't posted since 2016, and it was a popular source of information and discussion within the virtual world community. However, buried here, in two separate posts from 2003, one can find a very interesting interview with a famous in-game alias, Mia Wallace. And that's where our story earlier began. With Mia going in-depth into how it was formed, from the early days in beta, all the way up to that moment in the interview, when everything seemed to be out of her control. So now we know more about the story of Mia, JC Soprano, and the criminal ongoings within the game. But let's have a look at how the media painted the picture. And trust me, there is plenty of coverage on this with all different types of information. The player-run economy had a significant role in The Sims Online's downfall, and not even a year later, things surfaced within the media about this so-called in-game mafia. The media started reporting it through articles and TV news reports. I managed to find the following information in an article from 2003 by siliconvalley.com. This is no longer available to read, but using the Wayback Machine, I was able to retrieve it. In the article, it's mentioned how some players of The Sims Online are forming organized groups or clans within the game. Some of these groups have a criminal or mafia-themed focus, and players in these groups often engage in disruptive or illegal behavior that violates the game's rules. These are called grievers, who delight in creating misery for other players, such as stealing money or appropriating another's online identity. They also wrote that Will Wright, the creator of The Sims games, including The Sims Online, was both intrigued and vexed by the rise of the criminal underworld. During an interview at a trade show, he revealed that he checks in every night to keep tabs on their activities. However, Maxis was helpless to intervene since all of the group's dealings took place outside the game via Yahoo Messenger or by phone. In another article by The Guardian that covered a blog post by Randy Farmer and Bryce Glass on web reputation, author Randy Farmer recalls how the Mafia were able to carry out their crimes, and that was by way of sending a message to new players that roughly said the following. Hi, I see from your hub that you're new to the area. Give me all your simoleons, or my friends and I will make it impossible to rent a house. We will all mark you as untrustworthy, turning your hub solid red, with no more room for green, and no one will play with you. You have five minutes to comply. If you think I'm kidding, look at your hub. Three of us have already marked you red. What this meant was that the Mafia essentially exploited the game's user reputation system to extort virtual currency from these new users. Red links were also a sort of demerit that shows others how many enemies a player has. The more enemies, the less others would be inclined to play with you. Speaking of the game's downfall, did I mention the cyber brothels? Oh, you know, in-game brothels where they had underage players do all sorts. No biggie. Not like Max has let it all happen. Nope. They intervened from the very beginning, didn't they? No, but seriously, I will have to cover the story in my next video, as there's a lot. So consider this a part one of sorts. An interesting point to make here as well is that in my research, I found conflicting timelines, where Mia says there are no brothels or mafia clans during beta, 
However, this research paper right here states that in fact they had been set up from the very beginning. It does seem strange that one breaks bad barely a year into the game, but that might just go to show how boring The Sims Online really was. Now, to say that the game developers at Maxis encouraged this behavior would be wrong. Oh my god! <laughs> Bruh. However, they weren't in a rush to ban or stop these factions from continuing their antisocial behavior within the game, as we know from Mia's story and all of this media coverage. Also, remember the clothing rack glitch I mentioned earlier? Well, they took way too long to fix, and by the time they did, inflation in-game was so substantial that land and item values made the entire in-game economy collapse. But let's quickly go back to Mia a second. I was so intrigued as to who is behind all of this chaos. And I mean, yes, we have JC Soprano, who obviously had a huge part in all of this, and who in the end was crowned true mafia king. But throughout the digging, I've always felt this was set up by somebody else. And I have a feeling they just needed the idea and a fall guy. A woman by the name of Jennifer recalls her introduction to the Sims video game during her second year in college when her friend introduced her to the game, and they spent all their time playing it. With a deep fascination for it, she eagerly placed it on her Christmas wish list, marking the beginning of an enduring addiction. As fate would have it, news of an online iteration of the game being beta tested through AOL reached Jennifer and her husband Piers. Both eagerly joined the testing, sharing one avatar by the name of Roller Girl, a character inspired from Boogie Nights. Their joint mission? to conquer the top 100 house list and skill in Alphaville. They were both putting in 12 to 16 hours a day into the game in separate shifts. When one of them was at work, the other would check in to see what was happening in game. Then, tragedy struck. There was a complete wipe after beta testing before the release of the game, so the two lost their avatar roller girl. When they got back into the game, someone had started impersonating them with the same avatar. Jennifer described as being very sad about this. However, they moved on to making the avatar of Mia Wallace, called in sick to work, and managed to rebuild Sim Sorority House in 28 hours. In the Silicon Valley article, they interview Jennifer's husband, also co-creator of Mia Wallace, Piers Mathieson. They explain how their clan, named Sims Shadow Government, started off as a way to keep the peace and police within the game, imposing fair rules on the players and put a stop to the harassment. However, somewhere along the way, they broke bad? I mean... <laughs> Even if we go back to their alias, the character of Mia in Pulp Fiction is the wife of a powerful Los Angeles gangster, Marcellus Wallace, and is depicted as a stylish, confident, and enigmatic figure. Mia is also portrayed as being highly intelligent and well-read, as evidenced by her conversation with Vincent. Despite her privileged and dangerous lifestyle, she is capable of being introspective and philosophical, and she has a penchant for asking deep and probing questions. Another aspect of Mia's character is her tendency to push boundaries and take risks. This is seen most famously in the scene where she insists that Vincent take her to a retro-themed restaurant and order a $5 milkshake, which leads to them dancing together and eventually her... I don't want to be demonetized. Mia's love of thrills and excitement adds to her mystique and makes her a compelling character, so it's no coincidence that the leader of this clan chose this pseudonym for her character. And I think both and her husband wanted a thrill in the game. To then downplay it and say, oh no, we wanted to protect the people, is a bit of a cop-out. But who knows, maybe family, friends, and even co-workers heard of this mess and they wanted to come out on top. Throughout the interview with Ludlow, the username Direbrook was frequently mentioned, a clear source of trouble for Mia and the Wallace family. Direbrook chimed in the comment section, accusing Ludlow of publishing private emails without consent, suggesting that Will Wright encouraged Mia's actions to add intrigue to the game, and claiming to have seen the Sim Shadow government paying individuals to occupy lots and boost their ranking. 
So now I'm not so sure about how clean Jennifer and Piers' involvement was in all of this. Interestingly though, Peter Ludlow himself faced a lot of criticism when all of his blog posts about the ongoing crime within Sims Online went live. Once published, EA ended up terminating his account. He claims EA was trying to censor him, even though all the while they did nothing about the child cyber brothels and rampant mafiosos. Were Jennifer, Piers, and Peter all being silenced by EA? In May 2003, Wired News reported that massive multiplayer online games will be a major focus at the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles, but the buzz is expected to be negative after a disappointing year for high-profile game launches. The Sims Online was a highly anticipated game that did not meet expectations, and Star Wars Galaxies was delayed. Subscription-based multiplayer games were seen as a way for the game industry to move away from selling boxed products in retail places and to expand their audience beyond young male gamers. However, the disappointing sales of The Sims Online had been a reality check. Shortly after, in December of 2003, Mia was noted to be playing Star Wars Galaxies with her Sims Online husband, Mo Wallace, signaling a shift in player interests. In the end, Mia ended up leaving the game to play Star Wars Galaxies and leaving the fort up to some other players, who then also shifted their interest elsewhere. JC Soprano followed them to Star Wars Galaxies, further cementing down the evolving landscape of online gaming communities and the fall of The Sims Online. Alright guys, there you have it, the dark underbelly of The Sims Online, the criminal underworld exposed. I really want to know your thoughts about this one, it's such an interesting topic and I kind of wanted the video to be maybe an hour long with so much information that is out there, but I think everyone would have been bored to tears, so I tried to make it very compact. Let me know your thoughts about this, I would really love to know what you think or better yet, what you know. If you have any details, please put them down in the comments, and maybe I'll do another video based on this. I would like to thank my social channel members, Jiggly, Chrissy Pine, and Bells. Thank you for your support. I would also like to thank my patrons, Negative Dana, Nathan Lim, Artsy Flashback, Kitajan the Arcane Archer, Amy Hassel, ML, Adele Isted, Midori, and Jolina. Thank you so much for supporting my channel. That's it for today's video, thank you all so much for watching, please like the video if you enjoyed it and let me know your theories in the comments below. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram for more lore and updates. I'll see you in my next video, bye!